Okay, cool. So I am here at SIGGRAPH 2025 with Director of Research at NVIDIA Research, Shalini DeMello. Thank you so much for joining me to today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I wanted to first start out with uh, like a general introduction on yourself because you are working on some really incredible projects revolving around humans and dynamic avatars. So would you mind just giving a like quick intro uh, introduction about yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, so I'm a Director of Research at NVIDIA. Um, I'm part of the larger NVIDIA research organization, and I lead a team on AI-mediated reality and interaction research. Mm -hmm. And our mission is to basically enable human-computer interaction grounded in the physical reality um, of the 3D spaces. Mm. Got it. That's uh, very cool to you know, have you here. And it's also amazing to see some of the work that your lab has been putting out lately. One of the ones that I really want to touch on first has been Queen. And uh, from it, from people who like don't know, you're able to reconstruct very lifelike 3D avatars of people that are dynamic, so not even like static any longer. And so I saw the demo at GTC earlier this year, and now you're showing it again here at SIGGRAPH. And so I wanted to see if you'd mind uh, giving a quick overview of that project. Sure, yeah, thank you for asking. So um, the basic idea behind Queen is that um, Gaussian splatting enables us to reconstruct 3D worlds in really um, re in a really realistic form, right? And so now you can take the 3D Gaussians that you capture at one time point, and if you have captured, um, you know, basically 3D scenes at multiple different time points, you get 4D videos. So, so they're essentially um, scene captures ch dynamically changing over time. Now, what we wanted to be able to do is uh, imagine a future where you can transmit these 4D videos just like a streaming service or like Netflix, 4D Netflix, that viewers can view um, from any, any viewpoint, so also called free viewpoint viewing. And what we realize is that while Gaussians are really good at photo photorealistically reconstructing scenes, 3D scenes or 4D dynamic scenes, if you start to transmit the Gaussians as is, they're really large packet sizes and you simply, simply cannot enable any real-time streaming applications. So um, we wanted to figure out how we can compress these Gaussians that you have for 4D scenes and in a streaming fashion so that you know you, in the future you can like essentially transmit um, um, games or events in, in 4D to, to customers. So the Queen algorithm, essentially, you can think of it as doing, applying the ideas of video compression that have existed, like 2D compression, to the 4D Gaussian space, and exploiting temporal redundancy over time, where the information that changes is very little in the scene. So you, the idea is to kind of figure out what that little bit of information is that changes over time, and just to encode that residual or de delta that changes over time. And with that, we're able to achieve like 100x compression in the size of 4D Gaussian packets that can be then streamed efficiently to end users and they can view them in VR headsets or 3D displays. Yeah, and it's amazing to see the actual like VR demo itself too because you really feel like a sense of presence. Some of the demos that you, you're showing uh, are like a, say like, like a boxer or having a uh, family like moment, but you really do feel like you have to dodge out of the way or from getting hit because it's it's a weird feeling, right? Where you feel like you're actually there with the person. Yeah, absolutely. You're you're that's that's one of the big feedbacks that we get from the demo. So there's this one demo um, which is really nice content, multi-view capture content that we got from Clear Angle Studios in the UK. And there's a boxer, and you see the boxer in the in the ring, and you're actually in when you wear the VR headset, you're actually in the boxing ring with the boxer. And I've seen people when the punch just come at them. I've seen so many people like go like that, like flinch. Um, it's, it's really immersive, the whole experience. And you know, we hope, hope to be able to make uh, use AI and GPUs to be able to democratize this this technology so that it can reach lots of people. Yeah, I think that a lot of people just aren't gen generally aware that imaging has gotten to such a fidelity point in a 3D and dynamic 3D capacity that it just looks like you're really there with, with someone. And so I'm kind of curious. Totally. Like, did you have a specific moment in time where like you first see it? Was it like through like Nerf that you saw, or was it like Gaussian splatting, or like when when was that that moment where you're like, we can really get lifelike 3D? I think 
think it was it was with Nerf. I think it was uh, you know the first Nerf, the vanilla Nerf that came out even before Instant NGP. Um, you know, I think the quality of the multi-view rendering was so good. I think that was the first time you know those those Lego scenes and the tractor scenes. That was like all right. This is like this really makes being able to send 3D mm -hmm. to people real, tangible. Yes, yes, it's been like a crazy, literally five years since yeah. then. Um, and I'm curious, like what, what set you and your lab on the direction then of like dynamic uh, you know, expression and reconstruction? Yeah, so I think um, one of the big projects that we had in our team was around 3D telepresence. And the idea was, you know, it sort of started during the pandemic where a lot of people were holed up and they were using a lot of Zoom calls and there was a lot of Zoom fatigue. And we started to ask the question of like, how can we make this uh, telepresence, enable telepresence in 3D and mm -hmm. have the sense of connection. Mm -hmm. And that, so, so there we were trying to connect two humans and sort of reconstruct them in 3D and then send them across a transmission channel. Mm -hmm. um, so 3D teleconferencing. And so we had a demo on that uh, in uh, SIGGRAPH 2024 um, on AI mediated 3D teleconference. So that was sort of the inspiration point. And then we just kept going further and further and then Gauss, so that was based on uh, NERFs, mm -hmm. but then Gauss and Splats came along and so this was a natural progression to, to move on to Gauss and Splatting. Yeah, and I'm curious too, like when you are evaluating now, like say like, like Gauss and Splatting versus NERF versus say like voxel-based radiance fields versus like ray trace-based ones, wh what are some of the advantages that like the you know, Gaussians came with? I mean, obviously the render time, right? That's a really, the fact that it uses the GPU and uh, for rasterization, I think that's a big obvious one. Um, I think the other thing is, um, you know, Gaussians are also um, interesting in that that you can, uh, so there's a lot of work around um, unwrapping Gaussians and placing them on UV textures. So they become kind of like Gaussian texels that wrap around uh, standard meshes. So they also offer this opportunity to combine um, your traditional graphics with the Gaussian texels sitting on top like a learned texture. And then they can be moved moved off of the mesh to give you all kinds of different shapes, which is kind of a new work that we're showing this year at SIGGRAPH. Um, so, so I think the, these two things that it's kind of a, it, it marries the best of what traditional graphics offers, like fast rasterization um, and embedding on meshes, along with the, the uh, awesome photorealism of uh, learned neural representations. Yeah, it makes for a very compelling you know, pair. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on too, that you briefly mentioned, like video calls, for instance, and having that that capacity to really, you know, broadcast a more realistic view of someone on, um, say, like a Zoom call or like a FaceTime call. And so, I wanted to ask you about the, your latest demo, as you started to like hint towards with Gaia and like what that that work does. Yeah, so in Gaia, so we're presenting a method that is, it's a generative model, AI generative model, which is able to synthesize highly photorealistic 3D head avatars, mm -hmm. but in a controllable manner, wherein you can also control, um, you can control both the identity as well as the expression of the avatar that you want to create. And additionally, once you've created the avatar, it is animatable, mm -hmm. so you can actually provide a sequence of expressions of how you want to animate the character. And so that results in a highly photorealistic um, animatable character that you can generate. You can you know, either capture moments in time in 3D and save them for posterity, or like be able to communicate in a more immersive manner with other people. Yeah, yeah. and so when we talk about like some of like the generative applications of this, you know, is, is this something that can still run in like real time? If you're saying you want to like change someone's facial expression, it, how, how responsive is that like uh, capability? Yeah, it, it is actually real time, and we have it running on a ThinkPad on a 4090 GPU um, on a laptop. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on that it actually runs in real time. Nice, that's that's amazing. And I am curious, like, what what are your like general thoughts on like how people communicate? Uh, like, how will it evolve over the like somewhat short term, like next like one to three years? Do you think it's going to start to shift more into like a 3D world? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think the one thing that um, you know keeps keeps the um, sort of um, 3D uh, to not grow as much the market for 3D is I think the the displays in some sense. I think so. How you receive 3D? There's three ways to receive 3D. You could either have 2D displays that turn into sort of like parallax displays, depending on the user's viewpoint, um, and then you can have uh, 3D like holographic displays or stereoscopic displays, and they become a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. And then the most expensive is, uh, or you know, and then the third category is the VR headsets that you put on. And depending on, so there's a spectrum of immersion that you feel on the three types of displays, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the you know the the, the the lowest end in some sense is turning a 2D display into 3D parallax, and then a stereoscopic display versus like a VR headset. So the immersion increases, however. However, the um, the cost and the adoption in the market is is inversely proportional to that, right? Mm. And so, I think um, if we can somehow you know find easier ways to like deliver these three D experiences to people, mm -hmm. um, I think that is that is the way forward in a less like. Um, invasive manner and make it much more seamless seamless right it feels like over the last few years that somehow like the software side has really just like leapfrogged forwards and now it's more about like how do we have these different distribution channels and like ways to actually uh, enjoy the content in its full like volumetric capacity exactly. to, uh, to emerge so hopefully you know the, the 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 demos and the existing technology that is out there now really starts to incentivize some of these hardware manufacturers to you know give us full 3d yeah, I agree. I think it's a symbiotic e ecosystem. I think if there's more applications, there's there's more interest in developing the hardware mm -hmm. uh, and, and for end users and, and vice versa. I yeah, agree. I'm curious as well, like from like the sports side too. You know, we we briefly touched upon. Uh, you know, I, I do want to just like talk about like how do you feel like the content in which is being created over the next few years might evolve for more dynamic based you know volumetric capture, for instance, for people to you know be able to replay. At, at given moments in time in a more 3D capacity? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. So even today, I think um, there's a lot of offerings in the market where um, the players are scanned ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And then there's just their motion information is sort of tracked mm -hmm. in the field. Um, and then, and also like the stadium and the setting is like scanned ahead of time mm -hmm. and reconstructed in, in 3D Gaussians or whatever neural representations. Mm -hmm. And then the players are also scanned ahead of time. And then with their motion data, they're actually animated in real time. And that's kind of how it's presented. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that sort of, uh, so that, that motion is not completely fluid because it, it, it is not just just capturing reality and transmitting it as it is, right? It's it's sort of recreating the animation. Mm. Um, so I think now, like with the emergence of Gaussian splatting, with things getting faster to render, as well as you know the emergence of Queen, which is you can compress things. I I hope to see where we're able to actually reconstruct entire 4D scenes mm -hmm. um, in real time and sort of transmit them. So I I think that's it's very exciting that that these things. I hope to see the future emerging for these. Yeah, I'm curious from a compression standpoint as well, because some of these, you know, what's really fascinating about this technology is that we're just using 2D. Uh, as the the input uh, for something like like Queen, for instance, but it does tend to pile up very quickly in terms of that raw like input data. So I, I'm curious to learn about like the future of compression as well as once it is going to be delivered in its like final you know reconstructed form, how we can continue to make it be deliverable to like mobile devices or just a wider variety of devices. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. So we have no compression standards for 4D, right? And part of it is like or 4D or neural representations because the it's a moving target. So we had nerfs and now we have Gaussians mm -hmm. and then maybe we're going to have something else, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like the there's a I think it is as part of the MPEG. There's actually a volumetric video compression group that's been trying to think about standards around volumetric video compression, but there are none right now, right? I think it's so much in the research phase. I think standardization 
commercialization tends to happen when more it's like more adopted in products and in, in, in the industry. But it's a very rich and open area. It's so exciting to be working in this like 4D space. Everything from capture to compression to, to streaming to transmission to decoding. It's all the problems are wide open as a researcher to work on. Yeah, I feel like this is like a really exciting field to be working on as like a uh, researcher or engineer because literally like you're, me you're mentioning, it's just like all open-ended problems right now that, you know, in a lot of ways can represent what the future of imaging might look like. And so while, you know, we have a very intimate understanding of how 2D works now, you know, we're kind of entering into a very exciting age of exploration, especially if, as like a researcher. So uh, I'm curious, like, are there any problems that you're really looking forward to, uh, like solving in the future? Yeah, so the one that I'm really excited about is, you know, at NVIDIA, we're working on physical AI, right? And so Gaussian splattings are really great at doing multi-view, um, novel view synthesis. Mm -hmm. However, they're not always physically grounded in, in meshes and, um, and, you know, in physical AI. So mm -hmm. I think what I'm really interested in is um, with all these emerging applications like robotics and industrial AI, how do we sort of marry um, Gaussian representations with the underlying physical meshes and physical representations mm -hmm. to do things like object contact and mm -hmm. affordances. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that is one thing that I'm pretty excited about going forward is like, um, how do you embed those priors of the world in the in the physical spaces into the Gaussian 4D representations? Yeah, that's going to be a really fascinating new problem. And, you know, I'm sure if there's anyone <laughs> that's able to, to solve it, you know, it will be in large part contributed from NVIDIA. Uh, I, I'm curious as well, you know, we talk about some of like the physical AI applications of Gaussian splatting and a lot of it's being used in simulation for like autonomous vehicles and robotics like you were mentioning. Uh, I'm curious too, from like the simulation side of say even for something like sports, where it's just like if you have a, you know, 4D taping of a basketball performance, like how, how can we start to like simulate, you know, and, and be able to better, uh, you know, quantify performance in, in sports? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I think um, in sports, there's definitely the need to simulate human motion, right? Um, kinematics. Um, so that's that's a big one. And then besides that, the physics plays a big role. Um, physics of modeling the object and you know like a basketball yeah, being dribbled. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so so all of that computer rich computer graphics knowledge that we've built up in uh, modeling the physical world and the physics, right? I think I think that's gonna come together. That's gonna be the exciting thing. Yeah, there's so many exciting things happening right now. It just feels like uh, you know we're entering into a very exciting age of, of imaging. And so yeah, I, I want to say thank you for joining me to talk about you know all of your work and some of the future of this technology. And yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.